William Lane Craig is research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He and his wife Jan have two grown children. At the age of 16, as a junior in high school, he first heard the message of the Christian gospel and he yielded his life to Christ. Dr. Craig pursued his undergraduate studies at Wheaton College and graduate studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. The University of Birmingham in England uh, he got his PhD there. He got his uh, second PhD at the University of Munich in Germany. From 1980 to 86, he taught philosophy of religion at Trinity, during which time he and Jan started their family. In 1987, they moved to Brussels in Belgium, where Dr. Craig pursued research at the University of Louvain uh, until assuming his position at Talbot in 1994. He's authored or edited over 30 books. Uh, he's known for his work on the resurrection of Jesus, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, for the Kalam cosmological argument, um, which is fascinating. Uh, his work on time and eternity in relation to God and so many others. He's been written up in journals, journals of philosophy and theology here and overseas. And if you're in the service, I'll say this, and we'll bring on Dr. Craig. If you're in the service today, you had an opportunity to worship with all your heart and with your soul and with your strength. Jesus said there's one more area that we need to worship God in, and that is the mind. So you're going to get a full-orbed opportunity to be a complete person of God today, in that you have an opportunity now to engage the mind that God has given you, and to worship him with your mind and with your thinking. And don't get me to preach it now, <laughs> but we have kind of let this go in the church. We've said, you secularists do all the thinking, we'll do all the feeling. And what that ends up is us walking around just emotional bundles of emotional nerves, if you're not careful. That's great. Emotion is God-given and good. Absolutely. Absolutely. You see the balance, however, of the heart and your mind, your soul, and your strength. So it's very important, and you're going to be able to, uh, to do that uh, as we welcome Dr. William Lane Craig this morning. Thank you. It's great to be with you, and could I ask Kevin if we might have this whiteboard brought up here so I can use that? Um, as Kevin uh, brings that up, let me just say uh, it's been really great to be here with uh, Kevin and to meet Kelly for the first time. That's been great, and uh, we've had a, a terrific time in studio recording uh, the programs for Reasonable Faith. Do you have room here, fellas, for that? Uh, to bring it over here for the morning? Yeah, there we go. I won't be using the screen, so I'll use it instead. Um, and riding in, in Kevin's car uh, is an incitement to prayer. Uh, <laughs> with those small tires. Um, I don't think it's really a tire that you're scared No. <laughs> it's, it's sort of a living illustration of the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> you know, I think we should nickname the car entropy. <laughs> but today... Uh, I, maybe I don't need this mic. What do you think? Oops. It's coming apart anyway. Um, Kevin's asked me to talk about the question of meaning, morals, and the existence of God. And so that's what we'll do, and uh, then uh, take your questions and, and discuss this as we look at it together. I want to begin by asking you to think for a moment about a question. And this is the question. Can we be good without God? Can we be good without God. Now, at first blush, even to ask this question uh, might arouse anger in certain people because the answer would seem so obvious that uh, it would arouse indignation. Uh, Christians certainly think that God is a source of moral strength that helps us to live lives that we would be better than lives that we would have lived without him. But it would seem to be arrogant and immoral to claim that non-Christians don't often also lead good moral lives. In fact, sometimes lives that put our own to shame. But wait a minute. The question wasn't, can we be good without belief in God? 
The question was, can we be good without God? And there's a difference. When we ask that question, we're posing in a provocative way uh, a question about the basis of moral values. Are the values that we hold dear and guide our lives by uh, just uh, conventions akin to driving on the left hand versus right hand side of the road? Or are they perhaps just expressions of personal preference, like having a taste for certain foods uh, or certain types of cheesecake rather than others? Or are moral values objective uh, and binding independently of what we think about them? And if they are, what is their foundation? <clears throat> well, many philosophers think that morality provides a good argument for the existence of God as a foundation for moral values and duties. I myself rather stumbled into the moral argument through the back door. I would speak on university campuses on the absurdity of life without God, in which I argued that if there is no God, if God does not exist, then ultimately there is no meaning, value, or purpose to life. These are just uh, human illusions. Everything becomes relative without God as an anchor point for uh, objective moral values. And to my surprise, the response of students to this uh, argument, which was purely negative, I, I simply argued that if atheism is true, there is no uh, absolute standard of right and wrong, everything becomes relative. In, in response to that, students would often say, but there are objective moral values. There are some things that are right and wrong uh, in a real way. Now, what the students said didn't refute in any way what I was claiming. Actually, what they had done instead was to supply for me a missing premise in an argument for the existence of God. For we can now argue in the following way. Number one, if God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. Number two, but objective moral values and duties <clears throat> do exist. <clears throat> From which it follows, number three, therefore, God exists. I was arguing in my lecture for the truth of the first premise. If God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist. The students were responding, number two, but objective moral values and duties do exist. From which it follows logically and inescapably, therefore, God exists. Now, this is a logically airtight argument. If one and two are true, then three follows by logical necessity. It's unavoidable. So this is a very simple little argument. It's easy to memorize and therefore easy to share with an unbeliever. Now, without asking about the truth of one or two, let me just ask, is there any question about the form of this argument? Do you understand why this Conclusion number three follows logically from one and two. Is there any question about the, the logical form of the argument before we go ahead? Yes. Is this a modus tollens form? Yes, okay. that's right. This has the logical form. Uh, P implies Q, not Q, therefore not P, which is a logical inference form. So that if you have P implies Q and not Q, then it follows that not P. That would be putting it into symbolic form. Any other 
question about the logic of the argument. Now, why, why that is important is that it means that you can only deny the conclusion by denying one of the two premises. If you think the conclusion is false, you have to deny one or two. Otherwise, the conclusion is unavoidable, logically. But which one to deny? What makes this argument so powerful is that students tend to believe both of these premises. On the one hand, they've been uh, taught uh, and have a terrible fear of imposing their values on anybody else. They've been taught you can't impose your moral values on someone else. And if there are objective moral values, well, then that means that some people are wrong, that their, their moral values are incorrect if they disagree with a person who has uh, objective moral values. So they tend to agree with number one because they don't want to be thought to be intolerant in imposing their moral values on anybody else. On the other hand, they've also been instilled deeply with the values of tolerance, open-mindedness, fair play, love, and so forth. These are deeply held values by students today. Uh, in fact, they think that it is objectively morally wrong for you to impose your values on someone else. That is morally wrong, objectively speaking. So they're deeply committed to number two. And what makes this argument so powerful, therefore, is that they tend to agree with both of these premises, which leads logically to the conclusion. And this can lead to some very strange conversations. I remember talking with one unbeliever about the moral argument, and he would jump back and forth between the premises successively. When we talked about premise one, he would agree with it and deny premise two. But then when we go to premise two, he would agree with it and deny premise one. And so we go back to premise one again, and he would agree with that again, but deny premise two. And so back and forth it went with him unable to make up his mind. It would have been funny uh, if it weren't so pitiful to see someone floundering in this way in a vain attempt to avoid the conclusion that God exists. So what I want to do now is to examine more closely each of these two premises to give a defense uh, of them and then to ask what objections the non-believer might raise to them uh, and how you can respond to them. So when we turn to premise one, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties do not exist, there are some terms in this premise that need to be clarified. Notice that I distinguish between moral values and moral duties. What is the difference between those two? Well, moral values have to do with whether something is good or bad. Duties have to do with whether something is right or wrong. Values have to do with whether something is good or bad. Duties have to do with whether something is right or wrong. Now, you might think, well, that's the same thing, uh, good and bad, right and wrong. Well, if you think about it, I think we can show you that uh, they're not really the same thing at all. Uh, duties have to do with obligation, what I am morally obliged to do, what I ought to do or ought not to do. But obviously, I'm not morally obligated to do something just because it would be good for me to do it. For example, it would be good for me to become a medical missionary and go to Africa as a doctor to serve the poor. But that doesn't mean I'm morally obligated to become a medical missionary. Uh, for it would also be good for me to become a, a university professor or a farmer or a, a fireman or a policeman. And obviously I can't do all of them. So just because something is good for me to do doesn't mean it's morally obligatory for me to do it. There's a difference between something being good and something being my moral duty to perform. Or again, to take the reverse side of the coin, Sometimes all we have are bad choices. Whatever we choose, it's going to be bad. Think, for example, of Sophie's Choice. You remember that film where the uh, German soldier uh, taking a woman with her two young